Welcome to the uh, BC Regional Science and Technology Network video series on access to capital. Um, this is our third video in the series and today we're here to talk about market validation of an idea. Um, we have with us Tom O'Flaherty and he's our industry expert. He's been a founder and he's been a product developer and he's been a CEO and he's been an investor. Um, Tom's been involved in pro um, companies that you probably know and products you know like Simply Accounting and, and Maximizer. So Tom, we really appreciate you taking the time. You've obviously validated some products in the past. So how about you tell me um, uh, what are some of the steps that, that, that need to take place and, and why people do a market validation? Just before I get into the steps, Dan, let's uh, emphasize one thing, and that is that <clears throat> most founders really don't validate their markets uh, very well. Some do it to some degree. Uh, some don't do it at all. But it's really important if you're going to go all the way, especially from raising money and rendering something into a product and taking to market, you need to know that there's going to be somebody out there that really wants to buy it. So that's the whole point of this uh, presentation, is to offer some pointers on how you do that effectively is first of all you have to define a target customer so in order to be able to ask your market you have to know uh, what it is and then you have to be clear on what their problem is and uh, ideally get them to confirm that you have to describe to them your solution and then find out if there are alternatives that they have Great, Tom. So, so, so really what we're trying to find out is, you know, uh, we're, we want to talk to our target customer. And so um, what are some examples of a, uh, of a target customer? There's lots and lots of examples. Customers generally fall into two broad groups, individual people and organizations. So the first one might be arthritis pain. This would be people. Uh, the second one would be a person within an organization, so a controller in a medium manufacturer's. Or, Dan, it might even be executive directors of nonprofit societies. The whole point is, is can you define them well enough to actually find them and ask them some questions? Now, assuming that uh, you, you found them, you've identified them, um, what are the questions that you have to ask that, uh, that target group? First of all, do they have the problem? And as simple as this may sound, it's one that some founders will skip over. They simply assume because they think the target market has the problem, then that's conclusive. So the first thing you have to do is to verify, does your target market have the problem? The second question is equally important. Is it a big problem or a nuisance? Is this a problem that they're losing sleep over? As some investors might say, a bleeding from the neck problem. And the third one is a bit more subtle, and that is assuming you've got yes answers to the first two is what would they pay for a solution and um, we're not talking about precision here but would they pay hundreds of dollars or thousands or or tens of thousands so you need to get that answered as best you can and I would say maybe uh, a dozen of your target market would be sufficient we're not looking for statistical rigor here but we're looking at 10 12 a dozen folks and if they're all saying about the same thing then I think you can trust the answer so once you've, you, you've been talking to customers and you've identified that maybe there is a problem and you can solve it, you know what, what you can charge for it, how important is the size of that market to an investor? Size is really all important because investors, as I think we know by now, like uh, big markets. So that's the final thing you have to determine is are there enough of these folks to make a market? And this is something you can generally find out nowadays by doing research on the internet. So if you're after small to medium sized manufacturers, it shouldn't be too difficult to find out how many of those there are in your target market. And now if you do some relatively simple math, if, if for instance your market tells you that they might pay $25,000 for your solution, if you could make it, multiplying that by the number of these entities there are, you get some notion of the size. And anything with a, with a B, with a billion in front of it, is probably an adequate enough market to be able to interest an investor. So assuming we've taken a look, we've found customers, we've talked to them, they want to buy our product and we know what they want to pay for it and we know how many of them there are and that is a large enough market that's going to appeal to investors. Are, is that enough? Are we done? Gosh, if only it were that easy. But you know, we're only about a third of the way there. We now need to uh, assemble uh, a smallish group of these target market people and we need to develop a, a user group. So the user group doesn't have to be very big. You could almost say the more the merrier, but I've worked with uh, five to ten uh, potential users who are keen enough to help you. 
And these are folks that you actually work with during the development process, uh, testing out ideas and features, and most important, the user interface on them as you go along. And why should they do this? A number of them just like to do it because it's interesting, and certainly you make them beta testers and you would offer them a free product for a period of time. In, in your past experiences, uh, Tom, can you, can you relate what you're talking about to, to one of those companies? Yes, we used user groups in the, uh, <clears throat> the two products you, you mentioned, uh, Simply Accounting and in Maximizer. Simply Accounting was actually um, developed by uh, my co-founder, and it was developed for uh, contractors, small contractors, of which he was one at the time. And there were, I recall, about half a dozen, I used to call them the guys with the muddy boots and the pickup trucks, that would come in, um, bug us to see if we were done, because they wanted a copy, and also we would use them as uh, guinea pigs, if you like. We would show them issues around user interface and features and so on. And if they couldn't immediately understand what we were getting at, we would go back and, and rewrite it until they could. Uh, Maximizer was, uh, was similar. We had a half a dozen people, I can still recall their names, where we would test out the features, and if they couldn't understand what we were doing, uh, back we would go to rewrite it. And that's difficult, and it's tedious, and it's really hard, but you have to do that. You threw me for a second there when you said contractors and then talked about muddy boots and pickup trucks. So you meant building contractors. Yeah. So uh, I understand that now. So what's the, we, we've done uh, two thirds of the process. Now what's the last, little, the last step? The last step is equally more important, and it's one that many founders skip over. <clears throat> and that is, is finding out from your target market how they would expect to buy your product. And, and here it's sometimes uh, temptingly easy to try and, and take this product to market the way you think is best, i.e. easiest, simplest, uh, cheapest. But if that's not the way that they would expect to buy it, then you're not going to get anywhere. Now going way back to when we started uh, Simply Accounting and even Maximizer, in those days you bought product from retail stores. You walked in, you expect to find it on display, you expected to be able to talk to a, a salesperson about it, and that's where you went to buy product. And it was not easy getting into retail stores. It was very difficult. Uh, we were tempted just to, uh, to run advertisements and have them call an 800 number, much easier. But that would not have worked until we eventually got credibility. So we had to go to retail stores, as difficult as it was, and that did work because that's where our target market went to buy their accounting software. So it sounds like you've broken this down neatly into, into three key steps. Could you summarize those one last time for the, for the viewers um, and tell us how important each step is? Yeah, I'll be pleased to do that because you have to do all three. You can't simply do one. First of all, you have to determine, are there a sufficient number of, of prospects on the planet that have a problem that you solve? And on the basis that you can actually uh, get this product to market, will they buy it from you for a price that works? And, and you can only determine that by talking to these folks in advance. Secondly, you must work with these people during the development process. And ideally, when you launch your product, there shouldn't be any surprises. There, there shouldn't be a question of whether or not people will like this or whether they'll buy it. You'll have covered this off as you're developing it. And then finally, you've got to take it to market in a way that's acceptable to them. So whether they're searching on the internet, going into a store, downloading it, or however they would expect to buy this, that's the path that you've got to use. So those are the three things that you've got to do to validate a market and to get a product there. That's great, and, and market validation is key. Um, however, not everybody does it. So, Tom, what are some of the excuses you've heard from founders that have been unwilling or, or haven't yet done their market validation? I, I think that the, uh, those that don't like to do this fall into two camps. Uh, the first camp is, uh, I think the word is hubris, or I already know. I don't need to go to that bother and nuisance, I'm confident that I know the answer. So, that, so that's, that's one excuse that I hear. The other excuse is a little more subtle, and it's, it's rarely admitted, but it's often there, and that is, I'm not so sure. I, I like this idea, I'm, I'm having fun doing this, I don't want to spoil my party, but I'm just not so sure that if I go out there and ask my target market if they really need this or want it or would pay for it, they might not give me the right answer. So I think I'll just put on the blinders and keep pressing on. 
So for those that don't do this well, those would be sort of the two uh, reasons or excuses that I hear. The one that I don't have time, I think, falls into either of those two. That means that they're either afraid to or they don't uh, assign it the right level of importance. Yeah, those are ones that come up a lot, Tom. Have you ever come across people who uh, can't narrow down to a specific target market and as a result are unable to do uh, their market research? Yes, actually, I, I do see that more often than not. Um, they, they do have a number of potential uh, companies or organizations or people that could, in theory, use the product, and they either don't accept or don't want to accept the fact that they've got to select one, at least for their target market, so they'd rather live with the illusion of a, of a large, ill-defined market than try and plunge into one uh, target market. And, and that's kind of an, an illusionary thing. But of course, if you read any of the books and look at any of the successful marketers, at some point when you're launching a company, you really have to pick one target and bet your company on that. And if you succeed, then you may get a chance to chase those other markets. But if you fail to do that targeting, you'll probably never get a chance to go after all the others. Thanks for that, Tom. We hope that the viewers uh, watching this will uh, have a, an easier time doing their market validation. It is a, a key step to uh, making a good pitch and to building a good business plan. And it is something that we regularly see um, done poorly by early stage companies. And so uh, take this advice to heart and, and put it to use and go out and find your investors. And uh, thank you for watching.